Greetings. Good evening. Good morning for some of you. Welcome to Asia Society's online platform. I'm Susie Jakes. I'm the editor of China File, which is an online magazine published by Asia Society's Center on U.S.-China Relations. But I'm here tonight, gratefully, at the invitation of my colleagues at the Asia Society Policy Institute for a discussion about Beijing's early reactions to the Biden administration and on the outlook for the next chapter in the evolving saga of U.S.-China relations. We're living in a moment, thanks in part to the year that we've just lived through, not only of strained relations between the United States and China, but also of increasingly constrained conditions for the flow of information between the two countries. So uh, while in just about any context, our discussants this evening would offer exceptional insight, uh, in the current environment, when so many sources of both good information and the perspective to read it accurately uh, have been hobbled, we're especially lucky to have two of the best, most dogged, fastidious, voracious followers of this topic to tell us what's what. I'm speaking, of course, of Asia Society's president and CEO and president of the Asia Society Policy Institute, Prime Minister Kevin Rudd, uh, who, as most of you uh, will already know, was an accomplished uh, student of Chinese politics long before his tenure as uh, foreign minister and later prime minister of Australia. Joining Kevin is Bill Bishop, uh, founder and editor of The Indispensable, let me just say that one more time, the indispensable newsletter, Cynicism, which if you aren't subscribed to it already, uh, you very much ought to be. Bill consumes and digests a vast menu of Chinese and English language uh, news, uh, scholarship, social media, government documents, industry reports uh, related to China each day uh, and publishes them in a highly readable form uh, with brief, often brilliant commentary on how to interpret them. Uh, he's also an accomplished tech and media entrepreneur, and he is a generous source of support and encouragement and advice uh, to so many of us for which um, I and my colleagues at Asia Society are regularly and profoundly grateful. So very glad he could join us tonight. Uh, the timing for this talk, which was scheduled several weeks ago, is in one sense felicitous, uh, as the U.S. Secretaries of State and Defense have just completed a trip to Asia, in part aimed at better coordinating policy with China's uh, neighbors and U.S. allies. Um, and as today, uh, against the perhaps appropriately frozen icy landscape of Anchorage, Alaska, U.S. Secretary of State Tony Blinken and National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan are meeting with uh, two men who are their counterparts, at least in the context of the meeting, even if the roles they play in determining China's foreign policy are not exactly uh, parallel to those played by Blinken and Sullivan. Uh, these are Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi and top diplomat and Politburo member Yang Jiechi. Uh, so if we'd held this program a day or so later, we might have had readouts of that meeting, um, but Kevin and Bill will undoubtedly give you the background to analyze uh, those statements with greater insight whenever they do emerge. Uh, and we'll all have a chance to test out Kevin and Bill's predictions uh, almost as soon as they finish making them. So that part will be fun. Let me say just a word about the format this evening. In a moment, um, Kevin will deliver opening remarks, uh, and these are, these are part of one of his regular updates on this issue, uh, an extensive compendium of which you can find on the Asia Society website under the heading, Avoidable War. I'll then moderate a discussion between Kevin and Bill, and then probably uh, long before I've exhausted my own questions for them, uh, I will begin to ask questions from all of you. Um, so you can post your questions in the Q&A box uh, on Zoom. And uh, I think there are quite a number of you with us tonight, but I will try to get to as many of them as possible. As always, you can find all our upcoming events and links to past events at asiasociety.org. 
Uh, and we want to highlight our new film series, Asia Society at the Movies, in which we offer screenings of fe feature films from all across Asia, and then a conversation with the filmmakers or actors or others connected to the work. Uh, next up on April 5th uh, is Indonesia's submission for the 2021 Academy Awards uh, in Pedagor, which sounds terrifying, but there will be a screening uh, and a conversation with the director and producer of that film uh, to follow. So I think that's all I have to say. And now uh, I will turn it over to uh, Asia Society's helmsman, Kevin Rudd. <laughs> Well, thank you very much, um, Susie, and greetings to everybody who's joining us across the uh, Asia Society's global network. Um, and thank you, uh, Bill Bishop, for being with us. Um, Bill, as Susie has already indicated, is a much needed and necessary go-to source of analysis and information about all things concerning contemporary Chinese politics and the economy and foreign policy. So, Bill, thank you for being with us. And Susie, um, as uh, the... Um, author and the pioneer and the perfecter of China file here at the Asia Society. Thank you for your work over such a long period of time. Uh, the topic uh, that I wanted to address in uh, these remarks uh, this evening over the next 20 minutes or so uh, is um, uh, how the Chinese are reading uh, the, uh, these early months of the Biden administration. As Susie's just indicated, I've got my timing all wrong. Um, when we set the date, we didn't know that uh, the big four would be meeting in Anchorage, Alaska, and they are meeting as we speak, to the best of my information. And so, uh, as Susie's already indicated, when we get the readouts, we'll be able to uh, find out, therefore, uh, how woefully inadequate my analysis have been uh, of how the Chinese have approached the Biden administration so far. Or perhaps there may be an element of confirmation, I'm not sure. This is an important uh, gathering of these four, not least because they're highly experienced individuals and not because they also bring considerable intellectual grunt to the table from both their systems, but simply because it's been, in my calculation, three and a half years since we've had the US uh, Secretary of State and the National Security Advisor together with their nearest Chinese equivalents around a single table. In fact, we've got to go back to the Trump uh, state visit plus to Beijing in 2017 when the team was around the table with the Chinese side. That, as you know, was the eve of the outbreak of the US-China trade war. Of course, there was a meeting between Secretary of State Pompeo and Yang Jiechi in Honolulu last year. Not a happy one from the best reports uh, that I have heard of it. But there is a problem which arises when there is a long, as it were, political and strategic silence uh, between the two capitals of the world's two largest powers. It can give rise to all sorts of genuine misconceptions, uh, or there can be a simple a lack of the adequacy of conveying basic transactional information. Or to paraphrase uh, Winston Churchill, it's always better to jaw-jaw than to war-war. There's a second reason, however, why this particular encounter I think is important, and it's as follows. Uh, that um, in the case of um, Xi Jinping uh, and his uh, senior officials, uh, the bottom line is because Xi Jinping has become such a powerful Chinese leader, um, because he's conducted such a series of ongoing political purges across the Chinese system, um, there is uh, a lack of candor within the Chinese system and the advice which is provided to numero uno. And therefore, it becomes doubly important for foreign interlocutors, in particular, uh, the US Secretary of State and the National Security Advisor, to be able to provide frank and clear um, information, advice, uh, and views, which then go direct, and I believe in a relatively unfiltered uh, manner, uh, straight through to the Chinese leadership through translation. I mean, linguistic translation rather than conceptual translation. So therefore, it's important, given the absence of um, what I'd describe as a fully empowered official class in Beijing, for foreign interlocutors to make the most of these opportunities to convey an absolutely clear-cut message to their Chinese interlocutors. Um, so in approaching this subject of uh, how do we make an assessment of how the Chinese side is 
uh, reacting to the Biden administration during its first two months in office, uh, I've sought to go through two or three different things. First is looking at the overall analysis of, let's call it, China's emerging national security discourse within its official literature. Uh, this is important. Uh, the reason it's important uh, is because it sets the tone uh, for the Chinese internal discussion within the Chinese Communist Party about its overall security circumstances. Now, the second thing I want to look at is the particular foreign policy discourse, commentary and statements, which have been made over the last couple of months uh, about or towards the Biden administration. And thirdly, a quick survey of what has actually been happening on the ground, and then to draw some threads together before we go to conversation and discussion. On the first of these questions, uh, which is how is uh, China viewing itself and its overall national security circumstances right now, we should probably back up for a minute um, and um, reflect on where the relationship had got to by the time uh, President Biden was elected. The long overhang of the Trump legacy in this relationship uh, is uh, very much in evidence. Let me make two broad points about it. Uh, the first is this, uh, that uh, as far as um, uh, China's perceptions of its own power and standing and prestige are concerned relative to the United States, China coming out of the COVID crisis, coming out of its economic performance through the COVID crisis, is now infinitely more self-confident under Xi Jinping's leadership than it was even a year or two ago. Um, that's because uh, of what the Chinese leadership have observed in terms of not just America's, but the collective West's by and large uh, second rate, third rate, and in some cases, disastrous response to the public health dimensions of the COVID-19 crisis within their own countries, but also the patchy economic policy response as well. And so uh, within China itself, aided and, of course, uh, abetted by China's domestic propaganda ap apparatus, uh, the overall year of COVID has been seen as a significant uh, enhancement of China's power relative to the United States and the prestige of its leadership relative to other leaders because of how they've emerged from the crisis. Um, the second overall uh, hangover point I would make is this is that the number of measures taken by the Trump administration against the Chinese, either in terms of tariff measures or in terms of technology bans uh, or in terms of um, other uh, uh, initiatives, for example, in terms of visa restrictions or a change in policy on the question of Taiwan. Um, in all of these um, areas, uh, by the time Biden was elected, there was an entire slew of these actions already taken or in the process of unfolding. And in the first two months of the Biden administration, if you look across the tariff measures, the visa measures, the technology bans, questions of Taiwan, and other measures such as individual sanctions against individual Chinese leaders, for example, over Hong Kong, uh, virtually none of these have been in any way changed, removed, diluted, uh, or in any way, um, uh, shall we say, reduced. Uh, where there has been one set of reviews initiated in terms of one set of technology bans, one set of reviews initiated in terms of a uh, particular set of uh, Chinese student visas, and one particular uh, Trump Trumpian measure on visas already announced, uh, but not implemented, has been deferred in its implementation. But against the overall sweep of these measures, by and large, uh, the Trumpian measures are still intact. And in a couple of additional areas, particularly technology, they have actually been added to, similarly on Taiwan. So against that background, and given that neither Tony Blinken, Jake Sullivan, Yang Jia Chu, uh, and Wang Yi, uh, all of whom I've known for many, many years as individuals, when they sit down around the table in Anchorage, Alaska today, uh, they are not simply taking out a blank piece of paper. Um, they are dealing with not just the accumulated history of the relationship over the last half a century or more. Um, they are also looking at the particularities which have arisen in the case uh, of the four years of the Trump 
administration experience. So where do we go to, therefore, in terms of uh, the um, uh, analysis that we might make of China's um, uh, official discourse uh, on uh, its own national security environment? Uh, some may question why we bother with an analysis of China's official discourse. Uh, I simply always say to people on this question, it's important to read the Chinese literature for the simple reason is it sets the parameters very much for the internal debate within the party itself. There are 90 million members of the Chinese Communist Party. You cannot conduct all business through the party's internal secret memoranda uh, system. There has to be a framing of the debate through the official media as well, including the specialist literature, which deals with areas such as strategic relations, international relations, and foreign policy. Uh, therefore, whereas we cannot form a full view from the official literature, it helps guide our analysis as to where things are going. So what emerges from this uh, quick review of the national security discourse in the last several months? For those of us who look at these things closely, uh, what strikes you most of all is the fact that the um, uh, Chinese official recourse to language such as uh, the rise of the East and the decline of the West, uh, um, is now beginning to pervade the official discourse. This is a euphemism not just for East and West, it's a particular euphemism for China and the United States. And within the overall Marxist-Leninist framework of the way in which Xi Jinping analyzes uh, the Chinese Communist Party's current position within the country and the world. This is informed by a deeply historically determinist view uh, of uh, China's inexorable rise under the leadership of the Chinese Communist Party. So this has become a remarkably pervasive thematic in the Chinese, as it were, national security discourse. Um, the second element, closely associated with the first, is that... Uh, the historical circumstances of the time are favoring China, that the wind is behind China's backs and that nothing really, apart from the Chinese themselves in some of their deeper analysis can prevent China's inexorable rise. There's a third element in the discourse as well, which is the securitization of everything. Uh, for example, in the current 14 five year plan, uh, we see new sections dedicated to security economic security. This is part of a wider discourse, which now points to an all pervasive concept of security being essential for China's future political and economic development. And that means that China's domestic circumstances and its external circumstances are going to have an increasingly pervasive uh, national security prism imposed across the top. The final point to emerge in the discourse, which I should make reference to, is the emergence now over some time, but strengthening uh, as each month passes to the concept of struggle. Uh, the Chinese term is doujong. And for those of us who are familiar with the way in which this term has been used, uh, ever since uh, Mao Zedong's rectification movement within the Chinese Communist Party uh, at Yan'an back in 1942 through to the present, uh, when we start to hear the word doujong used either internally or externally, uh, it means that things are hardening up big time. Of course, domestically, we now have a party rectification campaign fully underway. But the whole notion of doujang or struggle now being seen as essential in China's overall management of its security environment externally is something we should all focus on as well. In fact, the language on this has become quite explicit uh, through um, a number of uh, China's uh, military representatives and what have become increasingly unguarded comments about uh, how they perceive China's current relationship with the United States. So in overall terms, what I would say, therefore, as far as the general national security discourse is concerned, we see a hardening and sharpening of the language, increasingly um, the securitization of everything, an underlying confidence that China's time has come, and an, un an underlying belief that the US and the West are now in a form of irreversible decline. 
Going to the second part of the analysis, uh, what actually do we then see in terms of China's official discourse emerging uh, in relation to the Biden administration in particular? Uh, once again, uh, this is important, but it's largely uh, unfolded in a number of stages since uh, the election of Biden in November and through to the inauguration, obviously, since the, tw the 20th of January. I suppose we could describe it as unfolding in uh, three particular ways, and all of these ways are somewhat softer and more diplomatic in tone, as you would expect, when measured against the hard national security policy uh, discourse that I've just referred to. What have we seen in these two or three stages? Well, to begin with, we had both uh, Wang Yi, the foreign minister, and Yang Jiechi, the Politburo member and former foreign minister, and Xi Jinping's number one foreign policy advisor, those who currently sit across the table from Tony Blinken and Jake Sullivan in Anchorage. Both Yang Jiechi and Wang Yi uh, spent uh, the better part of um, a month or so outlining the way forward. Basically went along these lines. If only you crazy Americans would realize how fundamentally you've misjudged China, I recognize the errors and the ways of the Trump administration and get back to the wonderful world of, um, of uh, global harmony of win-win cooperation um, and, uh, and uh, discard any concept of uh, strategic competition or adversarial behavior, uh, then uh, we can all get back to the way things were. Uh, this permeated quite a number of speeches and presentations, both by Young and Wang in the early days. Needless to say, in Washington, this fell on deaf ears. Uh, what particularly I think was um, ineffective on China's part was its de decision on the 19th of January to impose personalized sanctions against uh, some um, uh, 28 members of the outgoing uh, Republican administration, the Republican 28, I shall call them, um, for uh, their various contributions uh, to uh, undermining uh, China's national unity. Um, if this was some crude attempt to divide Republicans and Democrats uh, from each other on the China question, uh, it misfired badly. Not only did the Democrat administration attack China's decision to impose individual sanctions against Republicans, however much the Democrats may have loathed each and every one of those individuals, the bottom line is that the one thing that has unified Republicans and Democrats in Washington in recent times has been China. We then uh, looked at a second phase, uh, and that was what I would describe as, again, presentations from Wang and Yang and others about the need to begin to categorize the relationship rather than simply having America repent from its former sinful ways and come back to the path of the golden mean and eternal righteousness. What do I mean by categorizing? Probably best put in the language of Wang Yi, who said we need to put this relationship uh, into three sets of baskets. One, uh, red lines, strategic red lines, which were non-negotiable, referring to each country's core interests, leaving to one side the doability of that. Two, another area of strategic competition. And three, another basket, which is for the possibilities now of renewed cooperation between China and the United States. Um, this was replicated both in um, other language by Yang, who referred to new and potential areas of cooperation, not just climate, not just pandemics, global macroeconomic management, and even cyber. Now, even Xi Jinping himself, in his remarks uh, to Davos, virtual Davos this year, said that there was nothing particularly wrong with the nature of fair and open competition, uh, but fair and open competition should be like athletes in a race, rather than like people trying to slug it out to the death in a wrestling match. Uh, my paraphrase of Xi Jinping's more elegant presentation of that concept. Again, this is not met with um, enormous uh, resonance uh, so far in Washington, although in the elegant phrase of uh, Tony Blinken, uh, he has said that as far as the future of the US-China relationship is concerned, uh, from the perspective of the Biden administration, uh, they will be competitive in all fields, cooperative where they need to be, and also adversarial, where it's unavoidable or necessary. So in other words, uh, this, um, if you like, broad confluence in strategic uh, frameworks surrounding the relationship is perhaps beginning to emerge.
But the third element in terms of the diplomatic discourse or stage in diplomatic discourse, of course, came with the uh, two-way telephone conversation between President Xi Jinping uh, and uh, President Biden uh, in, uh, on the eve of Chinese uh, New Year. This was intelligently chosen by the Biden administration, uh, using this as an opportunity to extend greetings, New Year's greetings for the Lunar New Year for the Chinese people as a mark of civilization and cultural respect. On the actual content of the conversation, which ran for two hours, of course, there are different readouts, both from Beijing and from Washington. Um, Washington's uh, readout was President uh, Biden, of course, making it absolutely plain uh, uh, the American position on Taiwan, on Hong Kong, on Xinjiang, China's international economic practices, as well as its coercive treatment of other countries. Um, the Chinese read readout was a little different, uh, pointing to uh, the fact that all these matters that the President of the United States had referred to were China's internal matters, and that America should be careful what actions it took. But in addition to those uh, standard exchanges, if you like, between the two sides, they also began to identify those areas where, in fact, the two countries could perhaps work together. And climate, of course, was mentioned in both contexts. This, in turn, in the Chinese official uh, foreign policy discourse has led to um, a range of commentaries appearing, saying that we've now, as it were, turned the corner, at least in part, that the beginnings of the process of official dialogue the restitution of the processes of official dialogue, which have been in suspension for three and a half to four years, um, are now in prospect. And in the Chinese official rendition of the Anchorage meeting, which is occurring right now, now, they see this as part of the process opened up through that telephone call between the two heads of government and state. Let me conclude uh, these remarks um, by then uh, going to the question of... Um, uh, not just uh, what the Chinese official literature is saying about uh, its national security discourse in recent months, not just what it's saying about its particular, as it were, foreign policy uh, understanding of the Biden administration, uh, in particular, its interest in having um, a, um, uh, a restoration of high level official dialogue between China and the United States. But what has actually been happening on the ground on the part of Chinese officials, Chinese military activity, uh, and the rest. A couple of quick concluding thoughts. When you look at the big questions of Taiwan, uh, the South China Sea, and the East China Sea, uh, the Chinese actions in terms of um, uh, aircraft uh, and air force sorties in the Taiwan Straits and the South China Sea have remained as active as before. Indeed, so too have American actions uh, in response to those and in sometimes uh, uh, prior to those Chinese sorties occurring. So in terms of the actual substance and tonality of Chinese military actions over Taiwan and in the South China Sea, uh, nothing has changed. It remains as intense as it was before, but so too has it been with the Biden administration as well. Secondly, of course, um, um, the Biden administration has made plain through public statements with the Philippines and with Japan that the respective bilateral defence treaties apply, both in terms of any Chinese attack on Philippines vessels in the South China Sea, or for that matter, uh, any assault on uh, Japanese uh, military units in Sen Senkaku Diaoyudao in the East China Sea. The third thing I'd point, however, to is what I think is a major new development in early um, uh, March, um, February, March, which was a decision by China to authorize its Coast Guard to use uh, its weaponry uh, in, uh, in authorized operations uh, around China's coastal periphery. Of course, China's Coast Guard units are those which are out at the forefront of China's presence in the South China Sea and in the East China Sea, in and around Sankoku and in around the EEZ, exclusive economic zone surrounding Sankoku. And so this has created enormous consternation in Japan. It's led to a hard reaction from Washington as well. And this is something that is new. In terms of other measures uh, engaged in by Chinese uh, officials, both military, political and foreign policy, of course, we cannot go past what China then elected to do with the current session of the National People's Congress and their decision to change Hong Kong's electoral law. You'll remember 
12 months ago, China shocked the world by using uh, the National People's Congress to bring in China's new national security law. And as a consequence of that, we've had the arrest now of a large number of Hong Kong leading democratic uh, figures uh, and uh, leaders. The new electoral law uh, will radically emasculate uh, the limited powers which already exist for Hong Kong's uh, Legislative Council. So what do I take from all the above? And I conclude on this overall, is that um, what uh, China is seeking to demonstrate to the Biden administration and its response to it is one, it sees history is still on China's side and that uh, China uh, is becoming stronger and the United States over time becoming weaker. Secondly, that hardline realist view of China's position in the world and bilaterally with the United States is reinforced uh, by uh, the um, particular actions we've seen on the ground so far, both from the Chinese military and foreign policy establishment, where Taiwan remains the crucible of most, if not all, of the future of the US-China relationship. Three, uh, we see uh, from the foreign policy discourse, obviously an interest in China's part in reopening the lines of political and diplomatic communication. So therefore, my overall conclusion is for the first two months of the Biden administration, Chinese strategic continuity, its long-term game still being played for the 2020s, uh, all aimed at maximizing what the Chinese call as their comprehensive national power in security and economic and technological terms, while at the same time using its foreign policy apparatus to create new dialogue mechanisms with the United States with the objective of having as early as possible information about what the United States may be thinking of doing. Secondly, to taking the strategic temperature down in the overall relationship for the half decade or so ahead. Uh, and thirdly, um, to also uh, convey a sense of normality, while at the same time, China's core economic and military project uh, remains well underway. I'll conclude my remarks uh, there, Susie, other than to say that those who want a, a longer view of, uh, of all that I have said, um, there is a full text. You can call it the Thoughts of Kevin, nearly 10,000 words on this, which uh, I think has gone up onto the Asia Society website already. Over to you, Susie, and I look forward to our discussion. Thanks so much, Kevin. Uh, and I think we, in addition to everyone's ability to read your longer text. I hope we'll be able to um, dig into uh, what you've just said uh, over the next uh, 40 minutes or so. Um, the picture that you just painted uh, also emerges, Bill, in, in you know, your most recent couple of newsletters of the lead up to this meeting in Alaska being marked uh, and you're not, not being marked by expressions of comedy on either side. Um, so in addition to the deeper background that, uh, that Kevin just so ably described, you know, the, even over the past uh, couple of days, there's been this, this series of uh, kind of uh, exchange of irritants in the atmosphere, the United States announcing uh, new sanctions against Chinese involved in the dismantling of uh, civil liberties and democratic political institutions in Hong Kong, uh, to which Kevin just referred, um, China's ambassador to the US, uh, Tsui Tian Kai, uh, in, in what was maybe a moment of, of uh, trolling, asking whether the United States would be a responsible stakeholder. Of course, that's using the United States' own uh, uh, language for how China should model its behavior uh, um, when, uh, Robert Zellick was a US trade rep during the Bush administration. Um, in a somewhat more ambiguous move, uh, Beijing announced that the trials uh, on charges of espionage uh, against uh, Michael Kovrig and Michael Spavor, two Canadian civilians detained for more than two years on what are widely uh, regarded as politically motivated charges would take place on uh, Friday and, uh, mon and next Monday. Uh, which could be an escalation around their cases or maybe a pre prelude to wrapping these cases up and maybe releasing them. Um, 
So there's that ambiguity. And then there was this, uh, there's this uh, conflict over what this meeting even was. Uh, Secretary Blinken uh, explicitly said the meeting was a one-off. It was not part of a strategic dialogue as China would prefer. And then the Chinese foreign ministry immediately responded uh, in concert with various state media by saying, nope, it's a high level uh, strategic dialogue. So Bill, I'd like to just start uh, by asking you, given this highly aggregated, aggravated atmosphere, what is the best outcome uh, that a meeting like this could produce for the U.S.? Uh, well, thank you. Thanks, Susie. And thanks, uh, Prime Minister. That was a uh... Great opening remarks, and I, I had the pleasure of reading them before the before the uh, meeting started. But I highly recommend everyone go to the website and read um, read his long speech. It's very good. Um, you know, I think when you look at um, certainly what's going on on the U.S. side, the Biden administration has been very focused on on projecting strength and not looking weak. I think both for domestic reasons because they're very concerned about the perception. Um, uh, in D.C. on Capitol Hill, um, that they somehow have gone soft on China, so to speak, after the four years of, of Trump really taking it to China, um, which has a lot of support in the U.S. now. I think on the um, in, in terms of towards the Chinese, you know, they want to make clear that, you know, there are lots of folks on the Biden team who were in the Obama administration working on China policies. They want to make very clear that um, we are not Obama 2.0. And so they're trying as they're they're working through a China strategy, they say, as they're doing that, they are trying to thread the needle to say, we're not Trump, but we're also not Obama. And, you know, we're coming out with a set of policies that we've seen or continuity that looks more Trump than certainly than Obama. But um, I think I'm not it's not clear they are, are certainly are sure yet what they really want to be doing. So this meeting, though, I think will be very useful to, for both sides, I mean, the ideal outcome, I think, is not going to be, there's always no going to be joint statement, they said. There um, would really be to sit down and have both sides discuss what their red lines and what their bottom lines are. And that's certainly what the Chinese are saying. And, ask, and they're, they're trying to tell the U.S., these are our bottom lines. These are the red lines. These are the areas we can cooperate. And, and one of the main goals the Chinese appear to have is to get the U.S. back into this as as Kevin said, the strategic dialogue process, which um, is something that makes their system very comfortable. Um, it, it, it does not have a great uh, history of outcomes on the, on the, in the relationship, but it goes to this broader thing of, and, 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 and the prime minister referred to it, which is really um, the Chinese side, that, that Xi Jinping especially, you know, this, this East is rising, West is declining, which is, seems like a variant of, of Mao Zedong's old, the east wind will prevail over the west wind. Um, that sounds a little better, but it's this sense, and it's a term Xi Jinping uses uses quite often. The system uses quite often now, which is these: the world is undergoing changes unseen in the century, and and in that concept, there's risk for China as the world changes, but there are also massive opportunities. And around those opportunities are this: China is rising, and really the primary competitor, the primary impediment to China's rise, the U.S. is declining, and. That view has been massively accelerated over the last year or so because of the pandemic, because of political dysfunction in the U.S. I think because the Chinese system really showed that it was able to um, withstand the trade war. I think that, you know, at the beginning, there was a lot of concerns that the, that the tariffs from the Trump administration, the, the trade war would really actually cause a lot of damage to the system. It certainly caused damage. They would prefer the tariffs would go away but they were able to adjust and make it so the system could withstand it. And I think that actually gave them a lot of confidence. And so I see Xi Jinping really coming as, at this at a, at a, from a very confident perspective. You know, his, his historic Marxist, Leninist, Marxist Leninist historical viewpoint certainly sees that time and time and forces are on China's side, but it's still too early. The, the U S is still too powerful. The relative power balance while it's adjusting in China's favor is still on the US side. And so I, I, you know, what I'm seeing, what I'm hearing from the Chinese side is that they just wanna stabilize, lock, sort of build a box around the US-China relationship so that they can stabilize uh, the real difficulties to buy time 
while they fix what they call their their shortcomings or what they say, which are things like technology. The biggest problem they have, quite honestly, is technology and the fact that they're far too reliant on U.S. technology for what they call the core technology. So, so the outcomes for the Chinese, I think, are we set a floor in the relationship. We understand the areas where we have to work to avoid conflict and we can get back to at least some sort of a baseline where we engage in some level of um, regular dialogues. You know, the Chinese, again, they call it a high level dialogue. The U.S. says it's not. Um, I'm not sure, you know, the U.S., I think one of the reasons the U.S. says it's not is because if they say, you know, we're, we're doing a high-level strategic dialogue with the Chinese, they're going to get attacked here in D.C. for sort of, you know, falling back into, you know, I've certainly heard people from the Trump administration and the, the Republican side say, oh, whatever you do, don't fall into the strategic dialogue trap, right? And so they need to be very clear that's not what's going on here. But ultimately, you know, for the Chinese, it, 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 there is no expectation that things are going to change materially. It's how do they, how do they control the risks of thing excel, of, of the relationship accelerating out of control in very deleterious ways while they are able to um, take advantage of the sort of the fundamental historical forces that they see they're on their side. Kevin, I'd love like to ask, ask you to build on that a bit. I mean, I'm, I'm struck by the, um, paradoxical metaphors used to describe Washington and Beijing's relations right now. They're simultaneously frosty and flammable. Uh, and you've outlined the extent to which Beijing, uh, as Bill just said, hopes to kind of avoid the unpredictability of U.S. policy toward China uh, that was uh, the chief characteristic of the Trump administration's China policy uh, by bringing the, bringing the U.S. back into this series of um, regular diplomatic gab fest. So I guess one part of my question is, it, it, um, you know, w w would these dialogues constitute some sort of capture uh, of the American diplomatic establishment? Are they really that dangerous? Um, and of course, the US also has an interest in not letting uh, things get wildly unpredictable to the point where they spark miscalculation, um, particularly of the military variety. I mean, I was thinking back to um, when I first uh, moved out to Asia uh, in 2000 and, um, you know, what would happen today if something like the EP3 uh, spy plane uh, crisis happened in this kind of atmosphere? Um, so, Kevin, I wonder, is there a way for the Biden administration to kind of douse some of the flammability of the relationship without uh, a thaw that neither side really seems to want? Yeah, I'd like to build on what uh, Bill had to say before, because I think he's uh, right in his analysis. Um, the Biden team um, are deeply experienced. Those of us who know Tony Blinken, who know Jake Sullivan and the teams advising them, including, let's uh, remember, uh, Bill Burns out there now at the CIA. Uh, these are deeply experienced individuals who understand, as it were, the clear distinction between China's declaratory strategy and its operational strategy, or if you like, China's military slash economic strategy versus its diplomatic strategy. Um, and I think it is that um, delineation which is absolutely critical uh, for the American mind. If you like, American realism <clears throat> is, has rapidly caught up with pre-existing long-standing Chinese realism, which has always seen these as different domains as well. Second point is, just to be clear in our own minds, is, is what Chinese strategy is. Chinese strategy, as Bill just said before, is to allow uh, the natural growth of its economy through the size of its population, through the expanding Chinese middle class, uh, and through uh, the maximization of its international markets um, and the um, continued success, question mark, of its domestic political economy to grow the economy, surpass that in the United States, uh, and globally to see its influence, which is already now significant, expand exponentially as a course of what Xi Jinping has himself described as other countries succumbing to the gravitational pull of the sheer size and magnitude of the Chinese economy. Secondly, to, to also grow, continue to grow the Chinese military into what he describes as a war fighting, war winning capability and to complete its process of reform in the date he's given 
uh, and reorganization by 2027. What's all this mean? Is that China overcomes the capabilities gaps uh, within, as it were, its economic strength, its military capabilities, and critically, most critically, as Bill said before, uh, its technological gap in the domain of uh, semiconductors and microchips, because this is the absolute engine room of what happens with the artificial intelligence revolution as it affects future economic competitiveness, affects China's surveillance capabilities, but affects fundamentally the ability to fight informationized warfare in the future as well. So that's China's strategy. Its diplomacy in the meantime is frankly, in my judgment, to buy time um, and, uh, and therefore uh, to take uh, the temperature of the relationship down several notches China is not ready, in my judgment, uh, to run the risk of uh, a military action over Taiwan in the near term. But by the time you reach decade's end, uh, frankly, that becomes, in the Chinese calculus, a more realistic proposition. And in the meantime, to use time uh, to overcome the technology gap, which occupies such a large part of the space in the 14th five-year plan and the associated national technology plans we've seen in recent times. Finally, uh, Susie, in answer to your question, does this provide any opportunities for the Bidenistas as they approach this as well? I think yes. Um, uh, as I indicated partly in my prepared remarks, um, the virtue of a period of what I've described elsewhere of managed strategic competition between the two countries, taking the strategic temperature down to avoid unnecessary unplanned crises, um, identify your red lines around core national interests to the extent that you can, uh, prosecute effective and comprehensive strategic competition while managing areas of defined cooperation like in climate, that also can mesh with America's deep national interests at this stage. It could also provide America with an opportunity and a strategic window to rebuild its economy, to rebuild its politics, to overcome some of the frankly, the deep um, fault lines which have emerged through the Trump period and the period of COVID. Um, and two, as America has done so many times since the implosions of the Civil War in the 1860s, rebuild itself after um, first-class national disasters. Uh, that also provides America with an opportunity, I would think. And finally, um, leaving aside what the two sides must now do on climate as the world's two largest emitters, that speaks for itself. But there's a looming national security challenge as well. And that one is called uh, North Korea. And that one is what I describe as the crisis that dare not speak its name at the moment. But I have this funny feeling that there's something ticking away in Pyongyang at the moment, which is going to radically realter our, our dialogue on what China and America do together in the year ahead because Kim Jong-un ultimately is relatively uncontrollable. I wonder in the context of what you just said, and this is a question that both of you could answer, how you view the, um, the accuracy of uh, Xi Jinping's view of America. Um, I remember, Kevin, you and I had a conversation several years ago with a Chinese scholar who had been a member of, of uh, an establishment that provided foreign policy advice to China's leaders in the pre-Xi Jinping era. And at the time, he described Xi as having more or less jettisoned the traditional system of information processing on world affairs in favor of a very narrow group of highly ideological uh, advisors. Um, outside of the foreign ministry system. And so I wonder, um, first of all, if that's, if that's still the case and, um, and how it impacts his understanding of the intentions of the Biden administration of America's stature in the world at this time when it's been badly damaged by this variety of self-inflicted wounds with which we're all familiar. Um, I mean, it was striking to me that in your description, there was this moment uh, early on in the Biden administration when you had diplomats, uh, uh, Chinese diplomats, essentially saying, um, you know, let's let's return to normal, let's reset, because um, it doesn't seem like it would require very fancy espionage 
uh, on the part of Beijing to, you know, you could basically read a few back issues of foreign affairs to realize that the Biden administration uh, was not just going to be, you know, sort of singing kumbaya and, and back, back to 2009. So do you view this as kind of a Hail Mary pass uh, or a, a genuine misjudgment of the state of play? And if so, why, 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 why are they getting it wrong? Um, That's Bill to go this one. Yeah, Kevin, you go ahead, and then maybe Bill can. Okay, well, I'll give a short response to that because I'd like, really like to hear Bill's views on this as well, given he remains abreast of uh, all the literature. I only read part of it. I think um, on the core question that you asked, Susie, which is the accuracy of Xi Jinping's take on the current state of America, I think that's the essence of your question. If I've got it right. Um, Methodologically, as good scholars, the three of us would say, how do we know? <laughs> but um, let me hazard a guess, uh, which is, um, one, what I said before is um, we do have a problem in China in terms of the advisory network. I alluded to that in my opening remarks today because Xi Jinping is so powerful and the official class are so disempowered as a result and fearful of providing the wrong advice or advice which is insufficiently robust in the prosecution of, let's call it Xi Jinping's definition and timetable of the China dream and its subcomponents. And so therefore the response from officials uh, most acutely in China these days is uh, to anticipate what the leader wants and to therefore provide that advice mm -hmm. for fear that anything of a more objective nature will, will uh, not be career enhancing. That's point number one. Point number two, therefore, how therefore do you convey information effectively to Xi Jinping about the real state of play, um, about uh, American power as it currently stands? Well, part of that I think, goes to the importance of these exchanges, which are now occurring uh, in Anchorage, because the bottom line, the Chinese systems like this, and foreign barbarians like um, Tony and Jake, even myself in an earlier capacity, even now in a think tank capacity, engage with our Chinese friends. Uh, every word that we say is transcribed, it's translated, and it's circulated. Um, and that is a very effective means by which to convey an analysis. The Chinese may disbelieve elements of the analysis, but if it's internally factually substantiated, then it can give senior Chinese leaders pause for reflection. The third point I'd make is this. Ultimately, Xi Jinping's calculus uh, of the United States uh, will hinge on the analysis of the numbers. And the numbers that he'll look at in particular are these. One, the future of American defense outlays and where its military budget will be spent and on what. Second, um, the numbers in terms of America's economic recovery uh, and whether the underpinnings of a long-term as it were, rebuild of the American economy is underway. As you know, Susie, from your own work, uh, Marxist-Leninists um, and their own analytical methodology go very much down to quantitative calculus, hence their own uh, framework of comprehensive uh, national power, uh, as a means by which to inform their leaders about whether China is more powerful or less powerful than the United States, and therefore whether China now has more freedom or even absolute freedom to move in particular areas. So I think those are the two or three things which would inform Xi Jinping's view. I worry in conclusion as to the extent to which uh, Chinese leadership at present more broadly may begin to believe their own propaganda that America and the West are down for the count. That is a deeply dangerous conclusion to reach because it tends to encourage more adventurous behavior than prudence and reality would uh, otherwise suggest. Bill, you read so widely. I mean, have you seen any sense of a kind of pushback against the narrative that um, Kevin's describing? Uh, no, I generally agree. I would say um, in the uh, early period of the Trump administration up through the beginning of the trade war, um, when you could have people going back and forth between uh, Beijing and Shanghai and DC. Um, and so you could actually have some interesting conversations. Uh, there was absolutely no doubt that they were getting the Trump administration wrong, that the information flow was not working. Um, they were either talking to the wrong people or they were 
um, not listening to what they were being told. Um, I, I think now um, with the pandemic, and so there are much, much more limited exchanges, so much fewer people with whom sort of this sort of dialogue happens on a sort of non-official way, um, but also, you know, the things that, that see in the media from people I talk to um, that, you know, she really, what, I, what I've been told is she really does believe it, in this, you know, the rise of the East decline of the West and that it is um, very dangerous for people to try and argue otherwise um, inside, throughout the system. And we see that in, you know, what's popularly called wolf warriors where, um, you know, the Chinese and, and various uh, officials, diplomats um, are pushing back on criticisms about China. Um, it's part of this broader attempt to raise what they call their share of global discourse power to sort of better tell China's story because they see um, when you look at, as Kevin talked about, comprehensive national power, well, one bit effectively is their ability to tell China's story, their share of this discourse power globally. And they feel very, and frankly, they are very much um, uh, behind the, the Western media, especially the U.S. media. Um, but so, so wolf warriorism really, though, I think is a, is a reflection of um, uh, what is called the Xi Jinping thought on diplomacy, which is a generally much more um, assertive, confident approach to China's um, foreign relations um, in every dimension. And so, you know, and, and then inside China, when you look at what's what's allowed to be, you know, the Chinese internet is obviously very censored. And so it's interesting, you can learn a lot from what's allowed to be said. Um, and what also is, is officially pushed by um, various levels of the CCD propaganda system. Um, and there's, there's definitely a um, very much a, you know, America's decline, America's a mess, um, you know, America's, I mean, it's just, it's, it's a, it's a very, you know, this it's happened a lot, a lot over the history of the U.S.-China relationship, but it's, it's an intensity that I haven't seen in, in a while. Um, you know, I just want to quote from one thing that it came out right before Christmas. It was a comment, sort of a, um, a commentary on Xinhua news service um, that, you know, it was actually quite chilling. It's the, the title in English is Worshipping in America. It, it was the Worshipping America and Kneeling to America Soft Bone Disease Must Be Cured. And it was this very um, harsh, basically screed telling everybody that they, you know, they, you know, basically criticizing anybody who had or tried to express sort of positive or quote soft feelings about America. And, and it was very clear you know, this isn't to the masses. This is this is clearly targeted at people who have more influence in the system and around the system. And it, it just is, I think, really um, uh, illustrative of the pressures inside the system, where if if the the, the person at the top has a very sort of a, a more harder line view towards America, and and the way the system is structured, where as Kevin said earlier, you know, everything about struggle. There's you know a rectification campaign in the um, so the political, the politics, that sort of the security services system, there's no upside, career or personal upside for being soft on America. And so it, I think it is a real risk that, that, that the information flows skew one way and lead to potentially um, significant miscalculations. I mean, we have that risk in America, right? In an open system, we have that problem. And so um, and with the nature of the Chinese system, I think the risk is, is certainly... Um, it is quite significant. Um, and, you know, but at the same time, it, this, this sort of sense of pride and, and, you know, assertiveness and desire for more assertiveness, it is not purely sort of party CCP propaganda driven. It's real. China and Chinese people have a, t a lot to be proud of. I mean, it's, it's amazing what the country has built. You look at how they've gotten through the pandemic. They just celebrated, you know, what they call the end of the, you know, the victory in the war on poverty. And, you know, it's not perfect, but objectively, a lot of good was accomplished. You look at um, this year, it's the 100th anniversary of the founding of the CCP. It's, you know, there, there's just a lot of real sort of triumphalism that's real that is also, you know, um, enhanced through the propaganda system. And so, um, you know, this is, this is not a time when you're going to find anybody who's going to say, well, wait a minute, maybe we're weak or maybe these guys, you know, aren't declining as fast as the boss thinks they are. And so that I do think adds some um, some some not um, 
trivial risk to the relationship. Can I add a thought or two to that, um, um, Susie, if we've got a moment? Please. Yeah, it's that um, uh, Bill's right about, and I'll use the term, um, Chinese nationalism. Um, with Xi Jinping, we have a highly effective cocktail looked at domestically through the Chinese um, political prism of A, uh, Marxist-Leninist analytical rigor about the nature of power and threats to power, both domestically and internationally, um, um, uh, albeit with the real complication that policy and analytical contestability and alternative views have now been shut down. But the second turbocharging element in terms of Chinese national and international behaviours now uh, is the system's uh, active cultivation of uh, Chinese nationalism uh, in recent times. This is not a new phenomenon. Uh, basically, you could see the party moving in this direction as early as uh, the Jiang Zemin period, um, um, and to some extent during the Hu Jintao period. Uh, but it has uh, gone into overdrive in the current period. And as Bill correctly pointed out, if you were to be um, empirical about this, and compare where China was and where it is in um, 1979 to where it is now on the economy alone and living standards and the war against poverty, et cetera, um, there has been phenomenal progress against another measure, which is the degree of personal liberty and freedom. Well, people's ability to um, find their own job, marry who they want to at the age that they choose and kind of live where they want to live and go where they want to go, that's improved a huge amount in terms of their personal political liberties, that's been crushed <laughs> completely. And so, but against this matrix, uh, this is uh, where the party is operating. And one final point on nationalism. I've put a fair bit uh, of treatment on this in my prepared remarks, but not in what I said earlier today. We need to look very, very carefully at the emerging debate on Xinjiang, genocide, and the Winter Olympics. I said before, I think the great sleeper issue in terms of US-China uh, relations on the question of security is North Korea, uh, given the possibility that um, Kim Jong-un begins nuclear uh, weapons testing again. I believe another, as it were, challenge of, of uh, even greater significance uh, is the emerging uh, momentum uh, to uh, define what is occurring in Xinjiang as genocide and where that will then lead to in terms of calls for an international boycott of the Beijing Winter Olympics. Um, uh, you don't have to be a Rhodes Scholar to work out uh, that this is going to uh, tunnel straight into Chinese nationalism. Um, look at, for example, um, a minor example of how all this uh, played out in the case of the Russian Winter Olympics at Sochi in 2013-14. The evasion of the Ukraine came about a month later. There's not a direct causality, but it's certainly an atmospheric addition to pre-existing security policy realities. Therefore, one of the truly dangerous questions to navigate for the year ahead for US-China and more broadly for China and the world is how do we deal with Xinjiang, genocide and the Winter Olympics? It's staring at everybody in the face, but the debate has barely begun. That was actually one of my questions, Kevin. I wanted to hear your thoughts thoughts on this. Um, you know, President Biden has said many times that he intends to have a values led foreign policy. Uh, how possible? What what does such a what would an effective version of such a policy look like with regard to China uh, at this moment, given what's happening in Xinjiang, given what's happening in Hong Kong, and indeed uh, within China itself? Is there a, is well, there a I've always taken the view in um, foreign policy that our anchoring principles in any uh, country's foreign policy, uh, and in particular any liberal, democ liberal democracy's foreign policy, must be um, anchored in uh, three sets of um, uh, documents or instruments. One's the UN Charter, the second is the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, and the third is the UN Covenant on Civil and Political Rights all of which all states have signed, and in China's case, ratified, although not ratified the third of the three that I've just referred to, because it creates, as it were, a normative framework within which these discussions can occur. That's why, for example, 
uh, China is still a full member of the Human Rights Council in Geneva because it's the machinery established to give effect to, however poorly, the human rights norms which we've um, collectively as an international community agreed to. So President Biden is right at that sort of foundational level, leaving quite to one side uh, the other sentiments which are alive in the American body politic uh, concerning uh, human rights and human rights norms as they uh, apply to China, whether it's Xinjiang, Tibet, uh, Hong Kong, or prospectively on the question of Taiwan. Um, the, the, the salient point, and I make this as an observation rather than as a policy recommendation, is this. Uh, what Bill said before about the, um, the unleashing of um, Xi Jinping thought on diplomacy um, uh, and related to that, uh, China's Zhenlang Weijiao, its wolf warrior diplomacy, um, is that the more you read the text and see what China is saying and doing now in the Human Rights Council in Geneva, but also bilaterally with those countries who attack China and human rights, is that the level of, shall I say, comprehensive national disdain um, uh, dismissiveness um, and disregard, uh, which uh, the Chinese system now has for any international complaint about anything on the human rights agenda, is now almost complete. It is now almost written off. So when the classic response by the rest of the international community is that uh, we will advance um, a, a combined press statement about human rights abuses in X, Y, and Z, A, B, and C, uh, frankly, What's the most recent test case of that being? It's called Hong Kong. Um, and uh, Hong Kong, none of us can test the fact that it's part of China's domestic sovereignty. But the human rights norms, of course, apply to people's uh, domestic practices. That's why they exist. China, in the last um, year, has demonstrated its total, complete disregard for all forms of international pressure on its questions. If it had any concerns, why would it have done the national security law? And why would it have doubled down with the new electoral laws uh, literally in the last couple of weeks? I think we're into a whole new world of China's disregard for this. In an earlier stage, uh, post Tiananmen, China understood the economic price to pay. Now China sees no economic price to pay. Uh, and that's why we're in a whole new world, I think, of international pain on this question. All right, well, let me move. Um, so so okay. if I could just add quickly, um, specifically the comprehensive national disdain, or I would, I would actually call it the comprehensive national vitriol. Um, that's, it, it's really been quite remarkable just over the last um, few weeks, the month. And part of related to that though is, and I think it's very specific as well to the, the Xinjiang and then how it also relates to, you know, the, whether or not it's a genocide and, and the Olympics is a really, um, I think significantly intensified and aggressive campaign to delegitimize Western media um, in ways that um, I don't think, you know, the Chinese have, have long complained about Western media, but, but this is, I think they're really taking it to a new level. And, and so I think that is something that is, again, um, as Kevin said, a whole world of pain where that's, uh, we're just, I think, getting into that world of pain. Um, and I think it's going to get significantly, significantly uglier throughout the year. And that's an incredibly important point. Um, I want to shift now to kind of a different basket of issues. And then it looks like we have some really excellent questions from uh, our audience. So maybe we can move through these a bit more um, swiftly. I want to talk about places where, um, where there seems to be some potential, maybe, for a, a kind of balance of competition and work together between the two countries. Um, regional hotspots. Uh, climate change, uh, and, and then a question about tech and uh, trade. Um, on, on the first question, maybe this one goes to you, Kevin. I mean, the, 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 we're against the backdrop of this meeting that's taking place in Alaska. Um, two countries along China's border are facing uh, political instability that's of concern to both the U.S. and China. Uh, there's been the coup in Min Myanmar uh, on which China's leadership has been projecting a kind of ambivalence, even as citizens of the country, uh, many of them blame China for what's taken place uh, in ways that are quite volatile and, and, and even violent. 
then there's Afghanistan, where uh, the U.S. Uh, under President Trump promised the Taliban it would withdraw U.S. troops by May 1st. We don't know yet if that's exactly going to happen according to the deadline, uh, but that's either way going to be a pretty messy situation. Um, do you see space for the United States and China to make any kind of common cause on the management of uh, these crises or, or these types of crises, given the current state of the relationship? Um, let me take them in reverse order. Um, on uh, Afghanistan, no, uh, would be my um, blunt response, uh, not least because um, um, the um, strategic worldviews of China and the United States on Afghanistan um, are so many worlds apart. Um, and uh, China uh, would not want to, as it were, uh, pick up any of the fundamental security responsibilities that the United States has had, given how ungovernable Afghanistan has been for uh, the last um, 100 years or so. Um, for all the dynamics which apply within that country. Um, uh, so um, I do not see that. I think China's approach to Afghanistan will continue to be opportunistic, which is to find whatever resource projects and other related projects are of, uh, of use to it, um, and will seek to, as it were, expand its influence with the Afghan government over time, consistent with that. But China's posture in Afghanistan is largely defensive, which is to prevent any spillover effects from Afghanistan uh, into, let's call it, the, uh, the rolling uh, problems uh, in uh, Xinjiang and elsewhere within Muslim China. Secondly, on Myanmar, I think it's a more complex answer to your question, uh, Susie, which is um, along these lines. Um, there's often a temptation in the West, I think, to see this as uh, American loss, Chinese gain, as far as the military coup in Myanmar is concerned. Um, I have not seen any evidence so far which uh, proves to me or establishes to me uh, that the Chinese were, had anything to do with the uh, coup. Um, this was very much locally initiated because Tatmadaw, uh, the Burmese military, uh, did not want to lose power politically or most critically financially uh, to the civilian government of Aung San Suu Kyi after the National League for Democracy did so well in the Burmese elections at the end of, um, at the end of um, 2020. And so therefore, this was simply a preemptive strike about money and power, uh, a rolling Shakespearean tragedy in Burmese and frankly, other countries' politics as well. Um, and therefore, what have the Chinese sought to do since then, um, uh, consistent with their policy of non-interference non in the internal affairs of other, country, other countries, China will be seeking to stabilise its relationship with the Burmese military. It hasn't always been happy in the past. Um, we should not assume that there's now a seamless, happy relationship now for the future either. Uh, but certainly uh, the Burmese will be happy about China's overall hands-off approach uh, to political developments there. But here is the problem for Beijing and where there may be an opportunity for US-Chinese uh, collaboration on the Burma question. If Tatmadaw, the Burmese military, run right out of control and the hundreds of killings we've seen now turn into thousands of killings over time uh, as the country degenerates into domestic chaos um, and, uh, and the military lose all control uh, and we see um, large-scale carnage and, uh, and uh, crimes against humanity. China, as the emerging great power, I do not think will want to be in a position in the UN Security Council of acting as the Burmese military's permanent protector. Um, this attracts a lot of international negative karma, uh, and therefore the Chinese will be, I think, behind the scenes, uh, talking to the Americans and the Westerns and the ASEANs about how we can, as it were, uh, restabilize things in Burma in order to not see uh, the sort of um, civilian catastrophes that I've just referred to. Right, I'm going to begin to draw together some of the questions that we've had uh, from the audience, especially where they overlap with questions that I already had for you. But so I wanted, um, I think I'll, I'll direct this one initially at Bill. Um, uh, on, on tech and the economy, there, there's a debate in the, in the United States on how uh, America should respond to Xi Jinping's push for China to become economically and technically uh, self-reliant, which we saw highlighted during the recent uh, NPC session in Beijing. 
um, in uh, and, and on the general question of economic uh, of China and the United States's economic in- interdependence. In broad terms, one side argues that interdependence with China is a liability in terms of national security, in terms of values, in terms of the vulnerability of US companies to IP theft, et cetera, um, and that to slow the effects of uh, that interdependence as they threaten a variety of uh, US interests, Washington ought to place greater restrictions on trade, uh, technology transfer, scientific collaboration, visas, et cetera. And the opposing camp says essentially that to do so will only drive China to ramp up faster um, and puts us in a kind of explicit zero sum competition that isn't in the US interest and only threatens to uh, inflame an already too flammable dynamic between the two countries. Uh, So I wonder where you these days come down on that debate. Um, What kinds of restrictions do you think the US ought to be pursuing um, and which ones not? So I'll sort of take up a, a more higher level approach. Um, I've come down in the place where I don't want to be, um, which is I think that um, the Chinese already view it as very much zero sum. And in it, you know, the Chinese have, have for, for the Chinese system for a long time has wanted to develop, you know, develop indigenous technology around things like microchips, semiconductors. It's very, very hard. They have not been particularly successful. Um, but certainly the Trump, um, the, 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 the new era of U.S.-China relations that we entered into um, uh, during the Trump four years um, was, I think, the uh, sort of a massive wake-up call, not just for the paranoid types in the military and security services who've been, who've been talking for years about the need to um, become self-reliant in core technologies, but really made it a mass issue across all of society because um, first with ZTE and then with Huawei, um, the vulnerabilities were shown to everybody. And when you look at, you know, and China has, have, has had more recent programs. They had the Made in China 2025 program, which um, never went away, but sort of was rebranded or talked about less because it became so controversial now, when you look at the 14th five-year plan that was just approved, as well as the um, sort of the, the longer-term um, strategic objectives, I think it's called to 2000, the 15 year to 2035. Um, it's very clear that the goals are to replace as much foreign technology as possible. And but it goes back to I think also the earlier discussion we we're having about the China diplomatic strategy, which is it's too early; they're not ready yet, and so they want to buy time. And so then the question I think on you know for the countries and the, and the corporations that have technology that China wants that is potentially sensitive is, do you want to give them that time and make as much money as you can while they're using it when they're eventually going to most likely replace you? Or do you want to preserve your advantages now? And maybe they will catch up or leapfrog, um, especially if it becomes sort of a whole of system approach to, to innovation and science and technology development. Um, and, and that's a that's a question that I think a policymaker or some of the national security um, apparatus would have a very different answer to than say um, somebody who's at a Qualcomm or uh, ASML or um, a technology company. And um, but I think from this the signals coming out of China, both publicly and privately, we should be under no illusion that their goal is to is to de de Westernize and especially de Americanize any bits of the. Um, Tech, the sort of sophisticated technology stack that they can as fast as possible. And even this week, you know, right after the two sessions ended, um, Shioshu, which is the most sort of authoritative, important sort of theoretical journal that comes out every two weeks, um, the, the issue, the lead article is a speech that Xi Jinping gave back in 2018 about the um, how vital it was for China to um, become a scientific and innovation power. And it was it was soon after the first round of um, sort of soon after the U.S. effectively cut off ZTE, but it was before Huawei. Um, and so I think in part they published it now to say, look, she's been thinking about this for a while. You know, he's got the vision to lead us where we need to go. But it also, you know, the rest of the issue, several articles, you know, the Minister of Science Technology, um, heads of the two of um, the Academy of Science, the Academy of Engineering. I mean, this, the system is very much focused on this now. And so Um, The question, again, goes back to, should we try and maximize the profits we can get now and eventually 
maybe it'll slow them down a little bit because they'll have the stuff they need. Um, and there'll be a little bit less pressure on them to, to really try and make these breakthrough innovations and, and sort of leaps forward. Or um, given the overall state of the relationship, um, is it better to just sort of say, okay, this is, this is one of those areas where we have an advantage and we need to preserve it as long as we can. That's above my pay grade. I, I, don't, I don't have a sort of, I'm not going to make a recommendation on that. I think there's, there's a lot of very complicated and difficult um, discussions around that. And unfortunately, I think part of it is, I'm not sure we've had that debate enough to really get to the right answer. Kevin, nothing's above your pay grade. Uh, do you want to jump in with, uh, <laughs> with some thoughts on that? And maybe also touch on um, how that question applies to a scholarly and scientific exchange. I'd like to comment on the fact that we three projects, uh, it's Bill, uh, you, Susie, and myself, um, I not only know what Chaucer is for parties in theoretical journal, but we actually agree it on a rolling basis as well. It says a lot about uh, our, uh, our pastimes uh, and our uh, intellectual formation. So, Bill, thank you for giving me up to date on my, the upcoming fortnightly edition of Chaucer, Seeking Truth for those who don't uh, speak Chinese, which is the uh, theoretical journal of the party. Uh, I've yet to be published there. Perhaps, uh, Susie, you'll have a piece there soon. The, um, two quick points about uh, what's just been said. Uh, uh, on the question of uh, uh, China having a come to Marx moment on technology, or according to the come to Jesus moment on technology, it really did happen in 2018. And many of my own interlocutors in the Chinese system put it in these very stark terms. Um, we will not allow uh, us to become vulnerable on semiconductors like we've always been vulnerable to the US dollar. Um, and uh, from their perspective, and these are senior folks in the system, these represent two huge strategic vulnerabilities still to this day uh, to the United States. The Chinese Marxist Leninists therefore are applying their own uh, internal logic, which is what would we do in these circumstances if we were with America? Uh, they answer uh, in their own minds, well, we would screw China, uh, both through the use of the US dollar, um, uh, dollar denominated sanctions, the dollar domination of international capital markets still, particularly given non-convertibility with Chinese yuan, for reasons we're all familiar with, um, uh, given China's paranoia about making its currency um, fully tradable, given the um, uh, operations of hedge funds and what's happened with the Asian financial crisis and all of the legacy concerns it has on that. Similarly with technology, um, on the question of where the Biden administration could or should land on the question of uh, future technology um, trade uh, with, uh, the, with the People's Republic of China, um, frankly, at the beginning and the end of all this is about semiconductors. That's, um, that's the, uh, where the rubber really hits the road. And this is, a, as Bill has indicated, a phenomenally complex debate uh, for the administration because the technologies themselves are phenomenally complex and there is no such thing as a single microchip. There are multiple variations of microchips. And, uh, and therefore, and if you go to the subcategories of microchips, China is better in some than others and frankly is on a par with the United States in certain categories. But the gap is still three to seven years in other categories which are critically relevant to the AI revolution. So will the Chinese domestic self-sufficiency drive in this area work? Um, the professional literature that I've read on this so far suggests the Chinese uh, will have extreme difficulty. Uh, could commercial espionage deliver it to, to them? Um, a question I'd probably better not answer in this forum. Um, but... Um, uh, this is an absolute priority for them. On the wider question that you pose, Susie, about scientific and educational exchanges and where the administration is likely to go on that, I would anticipate that the voices that, which will be at work within the Biden administration will say America's overall soft power um, globally and in China will be enhanced by a reopening of the arteries of, um, of uh, student visas uh, into, um, into the United States from China. Um, and that uh, the risks which uh, all this presents to the American system can be handled in a much, with the use of a much narrower and refined scalpel 
than the broader meat axe, which has been applied to these uh, exchanges by the Trump administration. So we will have, I think, restrictions, obviously, in particular areas of, uh, of uh, research, and development and innovation. Um, but this will simply be an expansion of what also existed prior to 2016. Um, those, those restrictions existed then. I think they're more likely to become more intense, uh, more refined, more defined, and more actively uh, pursued and scrutinized by the US intelligence community, rather than the broad act, which says that every Chinese student coming to study in the United States uh, is an agent of the uh, Ministry of State Security. Of course, President Biden has long said that uh, the United States ought to staple a visa to every a high level diploma that's given to a, a foreign student. So um, I just don't want to leave this conversation without uh, uh, a little bit of discussion uh, about climate change, um, particularly uh, because uh, Kevin, you and the Asia Society Policy Institute recently published a poll that showed uh, a majority of Americans in favor of the US cooperating with China to address climate change. Uh, that's at a moment where uh, a majority of Americans do not have a favorable view of China. So this is a sort of interesting, um, an interesting poll that you did. Uh, and you and uh, former Virginia Congressman Tom Periello, um, who's been an innovative and effective environmental activist since we were in college, if not much earlier, uh, wrote in Slate earlier this week, arguing that the U.S. ought to be able to work with China on climate uh, without caving or endangering other U.S. interests by doing so. Walk us through um, how you think this would work, what the risks are, uh, and why you think uh, China will play along. Well, this one, um, Susie, I think... Um... Uh, both the American policy establishment, the Chinese policy establishment, as well as American and Chinese political leaders should be able to navigate this one as what I describe as a dedicated lane in the relationship, even if the traffic remains chaotic in all the other lanes of the relationship, or shall we say competitive in the other lanes of the relationship. Um, hopefully collisions um, evolve, uh, avoided, um, but to sustain my road traffic analogy, dedicated climate change uh, lane, uh, some cooperation, general gener management of traffic, uh, competitive speeding over there on the uh, other side of the freeway, and hopefully avoiding collisions uh, on the, uh, on the uh, periphery of the roadway. On climate, what's it mean? And I'd encourage people who follow the climate change debate to read the piece uh, written by uh, former Congressman Periello and myself in Slate. It's just come out a couple of days ago. Um, in the Asia Society and through our policy institute for the last year or so, um, supported by uh, Tom Woodruff and our own team, we've done a huge amount of work, um, frankly, anchoring a uh, second track dialogue between China's uh, climate change um, uh, establishment um, and uh, those with climate change responsibilities within the Democratic Party. Uh, this has been an Asia Society initiative. And we've tried to bring, as it were, both sides together on this question over time. And the whole objective has been that if the Democrats were to win the election, and we didn't know at that stage whether they would, and that at least conceptually, um, they both teams, led by John Kerry on the Chinese side and Xi Jinping on the Chinese side, on the American side and the Chinese side, would be able to begin with, as it were, a common framework of not just analysis, but um, uh, a uh, almost a work program on what needs to be done. I think for us as an institution, the Asia Society, this has been a valuable investment of time and energy and resources. I've chaired this exercise myself. Um, secondly, I think uh, the good thing to say is that both Xie Jinhua and Kerry respect each other professionally uh, and personally. That always helps when you're trying to, as it were, skillfully navigate these things through your own domestic systems. Uh, American politics... Uh, is as cavernous and as complex sometimes as uh, the Chinese political system. Uh, and then thirdly, on the substance of it, I think where the rubber will hit the road is this. What will these 2,000 pound gorillas, the world's two largest uh, GHG emitters, um, do together to build global momentum and lead up to the Glasgow Conference of the Parties, uh, which is due in the United Kingdom in um, uh, November, 2021? Uh, this will become a question, therefore, of 
What will China and America agree to in terms of their immediate targets for the decade ahead, given that both are committed to broad mid-century carbon neutrality? When will both economies be able to peak in their carbon emissions and how they will, how they will seek to go about it? If China and America can get on the same page as this, together with the Europeans, you know something? Uh, we might just be able to turn this into a big change dynamic on climate and perhaps with some subsidiary benefits for the overall tonality and content for the rest of the US-China relationship as well. I'm um, low-key um, optimistic about this one. Um, I think um, the reality of the science of climate commends itself to both leaderships in Washington and Beijing. And they know however bad the rest of the relationship gets, uh, climate change is already ravaging America, just as it's already ravaging China. Well, I'm mindful that we are almost at the end here. And, and sadly, there have been an enormous number of really terrific questions from the audience. I'm going to, I just spot one from our um, board member and my old pal from Beijing, Fritz Demopoulos. It's a quick one. So I thought I'm just going to ask that uh, to you and then uh, I will wrap it up. So uh, Fritz just asks, um, uh, with respect to the notion of red lines and regular diplomatic gab fests, uh, is it realistic or likely that red line transparency is actually achievable? So maybe we can end where, kind of where we began with that question. Uh, should we throw this to Bill first and then I'll have a, have a go? I've been yabbering on for a bit. Bill, what do you think? Um, sure, I'll give a quick answer, but uh, you'll answer it. Um, you, you have uh, much more knowledge of it than I do. Um, I think the Chinese have actually been pretty good at telling us what the red lines and bottom lines are. I mean, they seem to say it almost every every time publicly. And, you know, I, I don't believe they differ from what they say privately. Um, uh, Kevin, you, you could obviously correct that. The U.S., uh, you know, we don't have, we don't define, I don't think core interests are, are consistent with what the Chinese are. Um, I don't think we use the red line terminology. We certainly um, make it sound like um, things like Hong Kong human rights were red lines, but obviously they, they really haven't been. And so um, my sort of short answer would be the Chinese side, actually, I think we do get to hear what they are on the US side. I'm not sure we know, and I'm not sure we've really do a good job of articulating that. My view of that um, uh, very quickly, and uh, my greetings to Fritz Demopoulos as well, um, is um, uh, one that um, Bill is right. Uh, the Chinese declaratory position is also their operational position on red lines. Um, Taiwan lying at the crucible of all of this. Two, here, however, lies the real science um, of, let's call it red lines, in the framework of what I continue to call a strategic framework of managed um, strategic competition. And that is within the red line that it's called uh, generically Taiwan. Taiwan itself is not a red line. Uh, what may be a series of red lines is um, both from Beijing's and Washington's perspective is what level of um, coercion from an American point of view would be ultimately acceptable in Washington? Would it wish to communicate that to the Chinese vis-a-vis -vis the possibility of future cyber attacks on Taiwan, the, the possibility of future uh, maritime blockades of Taiwan? Uh, other actions towards Taiwan. Similarly, in reverse from Beijing's point of view, uh, sub red lines, sub, I mean, sort of uh, subsidiary red lines concerning uh, the level of, as it were, um, uh, American uh, de facto political recognition of Taipei, which has been unfolding in some respects under the Trump administration. So when we say Taiwan is a red line, um, yes, I think we'd all agree to that. But the real work and the real science lies in the sub-definitions. None of that can actually ever be done publicly. But there is a question about the internal machinery of the relationship at the highest level of political and diplomatic contact between them, and that is by the two leadership elites, to leave people in no uncertainty as to the likelihood of massive reaction should a particular set of subsidiary red lines be actually crossed. I think there is some wisdom to, in that. Uh, final point is, I understand the American historical position about not having red lines with the Chinese. I understand that 
um, uh, in terms of the public domain. No American president wants to commit themselves to acting one way or the other in a particular eventuality. But I'm not talking about public red lines here. I'm talking about those which are understood between the two systems at the highest level of politics. In the absence of American red lines in the past, uh, there is a danger in the Chinese system that they ultimately perceive that uh, the United States is permanently malleable. Uh, and as a consequence, you wake up one morning when, in fact, an inferred red line from Washington's perspective has been crossed on the question of Taiwan. And we end up with a massive escalation, which even the Chinese are not prepared for or were not anticipating. That's my concern. So I'm, I am up for the business of internal uh, clarity between the two sides in non-public communications about where these thresholds lie. So we have a no surprises approach. Thanks so much. Well, unfortunately, uh, because I could continue talking to the two of you uh, for the cows come home, uh, we need to wrap it up now. So thank you uh, so much, Bill, for joining us. Um, to you, Kevin, for your incredible insights. Uh, as we wrap up, I just want to note that it's um, just about one year exactly since we at the Age Society moved to all virtual programming. One year, more than 300 events across our global network. And we are still here in large part because of you in our global audience. So if you would like to make a contribution to support all our work and these kinds of programs, we would greatly appreciate it. And you can do so um, via the link uh, secure.asiasociety.org backslash donate. Um, so uh, good evening from all of us. And uh, we look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, Susie. And greetings to everyone on our network.